Testing, one, two, three, four. Testing, one, two, three, four. Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with me this morning? I don't say good morning just to be a ritual, but it's a good morning. Can you turn to your neighbor and say good morning? Why can I say good morning? Because who is good? 
God is good. Amen. Just thank you, Lord. Let's thank him for the moderation in the weather. Are any of you as amen? God, we thank you that you're in control of the weather. We praise you today. Good to see the Pulley family with us this morning. Amen. And the Colon family, amen, with us this morning. We missed you guys. And when anyone misses, you're sincerely missed. I want to say that. Amen. amen. Let's invite the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords into our service this morning. Amen. amen. Jesus, my Lord and Savior, all power in heaven and in earth, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, Redeemer, Savior, friend, we invite you into this service today, God. We honor you and we praise you and we worship you. We thank you because we can count on you being here with us today. We worship you, Jesus. We invite you into this service. Take control of this service. Take everything that we say and everything that we do, Lord Jesus. Let it be, let it be worship to you, Lord, King of kings and Lord of the Lord. We worship you today. In the name of Jesus, Sister Hannah. Thank you, Lord. Can we continue that today? We love you, Lord. We worship you, King. We bless your mighty name, Jesus. We ask that you'll pour out your spirit in this place. We invite you in, God. Your word says that you inhabit our praise, so we ask that you will inhabit this place today. We ask that you will fill this place up with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We love you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Through the sun sets free, oh, it's free. There's a place for 
forsaken I am who you say I am I am who you say I am nothing less I'm nothing less than I am who you say I am I am who you say I am I am who you say I am I am chosen forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me not against me I am who you say I am I am chosen not forsaken I am who you say I am you are for me who we are we love you Jesus we lift you up today hallelujah 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 hallelujah
seated in heavenly places It's where you are, it's where you are When I lift my voice and shout Every wall comes crashing Jesus has given me when I open up my mouth miracles start breaking down I have the authority Jesus has given me when I lift my voice and shout Joshua and the Israelites are facing a wall that seems totally indestructible. The wall has been there and almost seems better just to leave alone. But God gives them a promise in verse 2 that says, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands with its king and its fighting men. And like most of what God does, He makes a promise when the situation still seems impossible. And he expects us then to move. In order for the Israelites to see the promise come to pass, they had to march and then they had to shout, right? Landmark, your word is important. It is time that we begin to use our words to take authority over the walls that have stood in our lives for too long. Tell anxiety it has to go. Tell the enemy it has to flee and stand on the scripture that says, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart and believes it will be done. When I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down, I have the authority. Jesus has given me when I open up my mouth miracles start breaking out I have the authority Jesus has given me when I lift my voice and shout Every wall comes crashing down I have 
every battle you've won I am who you say I am you crown me with confidence I'm seated in the heavenly place defeated by the power of your name I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it all. Can we take about 15 seconds to begin to shout for the victory that God has already promised? We may not see it right now. We may not feel it in our bodies right now, but we speak to that mountain and we say it must be moved. We praise you, God. We lift you up, Savior. You're a mighty God. Praise awesome. You, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for your presence that's in this place already this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Praise your name, Jesus. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you this morning, God. We thank you for what you're already doing in this place. Thank you, Lord. Stand with me this morning as we go into the presence of God. I, I challenged you guys last week to step up in prayer. And I can't tell who and who hasn't, but I can tell that some of you have because God has been moving in the people's lives that we've been praying for this week. We've been getting all kinds of testimonies. And I want to thank you for being committed to praying with this church body. Amen. Amen. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we're going to continue to lift up all these names who are, who are battling cancer. Melissa, Sarah, Al, David, Vicki, Asa, Justin Haas' father. And we have a good report on Melissa. Um, she is doing better. She is going to have chemotherapy, but she is doing better. So we want to praise God this morning for that. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray as a church body this week that after she has completed chemotherapy, that nothing else has to be done. That she doesn't have to have any more surgeries, any more treatments, but that it's gone in Jesus' name. Amen? We're going to continue to lift up both John Gieselman, Susan Gieselman. We're going to pray for Dixie Crutzinger, who's still struggling with her health after months of the aftermath of uh, dealing with COVID and just her, her health conditions leading before that. Um, we're going to continue to lift up Maddie, the seven-year-old um, that we've been lifting up. And we want, we want to thank God that she's doing well. But we're going to pray that God continues to heal her, that the medication that she's taking works. Most importantly, that the hand of God is on this little seven-year-old little girl. Amen. Amen. We've got a new request. Brother Adam asked that we pray for a, um, a two-year-old. Um, her name is Millie. She's the daughter of a friend of his. And she has something, if I'm going to pronounce it right, right, if I'm not, forgive me. It's cystinosis. And it's, uh, it affects your kidneys, your eyes, your muscles, your liver, your brain. It's, it's uh, something that has to do with an accumulation of amino acids. I don't know what all that means. Okay? But God does. So we're going to lift Millie up and we're going to lift up that family. And we're just going to believe in Jesus' name that today, that today that God is going to be, begin to move. Okay, forgive me. God is already moving in this situation. And we're going to pray with that family. We're going to continue to lift up Sister Sisko's, uh, her uh, mother Ethel, Ethel Miller, as she's, uh, she's transitioned into a new home. We're just going to pray that that's a very smooth transition and that every person that she deals with, that she actually, whether they know God or not, that they just that she feels the presence of God in every person who walks into her, into her room. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue to lift up um, Carolyn Mankey. Um, she's in need of a touch this morning, and uh, this is, this is uh, Patty and Cheryl's mother. And we're just going to believe for a physical touch. We're going to just pray for an emotional touch. We're just going to believe and pray that God's going to meet every need that Carolyn has this morning. Amen. We're going to continue to lift up Ron Houseworth. Amen. We're going to, and I, I 
I got permission, but Patty Payne has been on my heart. Sister Patty, you've been on my heart in the last 24 hours, and I'm going to pray for you. This church is going to pray for you, and I believe that you're going to receive a word, a touch, a move of God in your life today in this service. Amen? Amen? And if there's any unspoken request, whether you're in this place, and there's a lot of you in this place, it's good to see all your faces. Raise your hand. We're going to believe that God's going to move in your situation. If you're on Facebook joining us by faith, raise your hand. We, we've been seeing God move. All you got to do is raise your hand, and we believe God's going to move. And we just thank you this morning, God, that you're already moving in this place. Lord, you're already speaking to us. Lord, we feel your presence. Lord, this is a good place to be, Lord. We love to be in your house. We love to be with one another. And we most importantly love it when you are with us, Lord. And we want to praise your name that you have already joined us in this house here at Landmark Church, Lord. And we want to continue to lift up all these needs, Lord. And as we lift up these physical needs, we just pray that you would move them in them. But Lord, if there's any need that we're unaware of, we just pray, Lord, that you would move in that. You don't need us to give you direction to move. Lord, you know everything that everyone needs. Lord, we have no clue, but Lord, we just want to lift up the names. Melissa, Sarah, Al, David, Vicki, Asa, and Justin Haas's father, Lord, and we just believe that you are larger than this cancer that they're coming up against and just believe, Lord, that you are already moving. Lord, we want to speak in Jesus' name against a spirit of discouragement. Lord, and we just want to pray, Lord, that you would overwhelm them, Lord, with your spirit of encouragement as they walk through this these situations, Lord, in this battle that they're facing, Lord. Lord, we want to continue to lift up John Gieselman, Lord, today, and just ask that you would touch John, and Lord, that he would know that you've moved on him, Lord, that he has received the touch from you, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that his body would re- be restored, and that he would just see, feel, and hear your voice as you do it, and you would move on him in a mighty way today, Lord. We thank you for what you've been doing in Sister Susan's life. Lord, before we request anything on her behalf, Lord, I just got to thank you for what you're doing, Lord. Lord, we got to praise you for that. Lord, we thank you that you have just continued to give her testimony after testimony. Lord, we see her faith being strengthened in this battle that she faces, Lord. But we just want to pray, Lord, that you would completely heal her, where you would completely touch her, Lord, and that she would just completely feel your presence surrounding her right where she's at today, Lord. Lord, and we thank you for what you've been doing in this seven-year-old little girl's body, Maddie. Lord, we're just believing that you're going to continue to heal her, that you're going to continue to move on her. Lord, that you're going to continue to encourage that family. Lord, and we thank you for what you've done there, Lord. And we're going to believe for the same move in Millie's life. The same presence, Lord. Just overwhelm Millie and her family and everything they're coming up against. Lord, we don't understand this complicated disease that they've diagnosed her with but Lord we know that you know exactly the button that needs to be pushed to heal her, completely heal her, Lord and to calm calm this storm Lord that this family's walking through have to deal with this and their little girl and Lord, Ethel Lord we want to pray for Ethel Miller right now Lord we want to pray that every caretaker Lord that comes into her place Lord that she just feels your presence upon her, Lord. Move in her, Lord. Give her peace this morning. Lord, and just, Lord, we believe that she is going to be a blessing, Lord, to every person in that home, every person who works in that facility. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that that they will feel your presence when they enter her room, Lord. Lord, and Carol and Mankey needing a special touch, Lord, we know to come to you and just ask for that touch, that emotional touch that she needs, that that touch of encouragement, Lord, that only you have in your spirit. Lord, a, a physical touch for the things that she's coming up against that her body's fighting off. Lord, we just pray right now in her home that the Holy Ghost, Lord, that your spirit would fall and that she would just be completely restored and healed in Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, we thank you in advance, Lord, because we are confident in that move that you're going to have on Carolyn today. And Lord, we want to come and just ask for that same move in the home of Ron Houseworth. Lord, that you would just 
you would just move on him, Lord, that he would just know that he would be refreshed. He knows your spirit. He knows that move. And Lord, we just pray that he would receive a move of your spirit. We pray that where he's at, Lord, as we pray in this church, that he would just be slain in your spirit, Lord, that he would just fall and be overwhelmed, Lord, in you, in you, Lord God. Oh, Lord, I thank you in advance for Patty Payne. We thank you for the spirit that's on her. Lord, I don't know everything that Patty needs. Lord, as I mentioned to the church, she's just been on my heart, Lord. And I just I just believe that today, Patty's going to receive something that she, Lord, she may be expecting it, and she may not be expecting it. Lord, but I believe it's going to probably be more than what she thought it would be, Lord. Have your way on Patty's life this morning. And Lord... Every person who raised their hand, Lord, I just want to pray that you would move in their life, that they would just, that they would hear your voice, that they would be moved from over here to over there where you're at this morning, Lord. We have a good God today, don't we? Let's just give him some praise. Before we go into the next song, let's give Him some thanks. Lord, we want to thank You this morning for the healing testimonies that we've received here at Landmark Church, Lord. Lord, we want to praise You this morning for all the testimonies of Your Word that's left this church and they're moving in people's lives, Lord. We're continuing to see people be moved under this roof, Lord, being taken from here to there. Faith be raising them up, Lord. This is a people of victory, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we want to praise you for that this morning, Lord. We just pray you, we just praise you, Lord, for your powerful presence that's already in this place, that's moving in this place, Lord. I feel in the spirit, I can feel chains rattling that these things are going to be moved today in people's lives and we just praise you for that Lord Jesus oh Lord we love you Jesus continue to give him some praise oh he is worthy Lord you are worthy praise your name Lord Jesus thank you God we love you Jesus we love you Lord we We lift you up Jesus we magnify your great name we bless you today God we worship you God you can be seated today Thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. We need more of your presence, God. More of your power, Jesus. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spin with you here i am to worship here i am to bow down here i am to say that you're my god you're all together lovely all together together wonderful to me king of all days oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you came to the earth you created
<laughs> oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I said, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If that's why you're here, would you show him right now? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Yes. Yes. Yes, hallelujah to the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God, my God, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Oh, my God. My God, my God, my God, my God, hallelujah, 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 praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Hallelujah. Anybody need the Lord today? Anybody need the Lord today? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We praise you, Jesus. We magnify. I wonder if one more time if you would just join us. And let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. And I would invite you as you're clapping your hands to shout with a voice of triumph. It doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth. Let's just be triumphant about it. Come on, warm up those vocal cords. Come on, somebody make a shout to heaven today. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I appreciate all you crazy folks. Just get wild and praise. I appreciate those of you that came expecting today. Did you come expecting today? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God changed my direction very early this morning. I believe I have a word from the Lord for somebody. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to a very familiar passage of Scripture. I've preached from it multiple times. We'll continue to preach from it in the future. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's found in Daniel chapter 3. And would invite you to stand with us it's our custom to stand here at Landmark Church for the reading of the word I promise I I won't keep you standing for very long I appreciate your worship and your praise today that tells me something about where your head is it's easier to receive you know that's easier to receive when your head's in the right spot I am so thankful that you were here today for those of you that came to be a part of pancakes and prayers we want to want you to know how much we appreciate you coming and allowing us to serve you 
What a fantastic time we had uh, in the Lord yesterday. I, I told somebody afterwards, I said, one of the greatest things that that uh, happened yesterday for me was when Pastor Chris, Pastor David and I were out in front cooking. But there, at one moment, and it, it wasn't just for 10 or 15 seconds, it was for an extended period of time. There was all kinds of cackling and laughter just, it was so loud that as we were out there cooking, we could hear the voices just erupting from in here. And I'll tell you, there's nothing like hearing God's people get together and enjoy themselves in the Lord. What a great time of fellowship we had, and we are so thankful for all of you that came to participate. Amen. And, and then for all of our helpers, I give a huge shout out to Pastor Chris and Sister Andy for working so very hard. And, and I know he wouldn't expect me to say this, but his grill that we used out here yesterday had a, a major accident on the way home. Uh, and uh, uh, we're just praying that they'll just give him a whole new one for what happened. Uh, amen. Uh, hey, pray. <laughs> pray hard. Amen. Um, but I want to give them thanks. Give my wife, Sister John, a thanks. For all of their hard work, hours, hours on Friday and Saturday morning. Sister Mickey, thank you so much for coming and helping. Sister Barb, thank you so much for coming and helping. We appreciate that. Am I forgetting somebody or anybody? Who? I wasn't going to recognize Denny Robinson. Either. No, I'm just kidding. We, 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 were, we were putting all of our supplies together and quickly realized we did not have enough syrup say, Pastor, how do you know? Well, I've been around this crowd long enough to know the sugar intake. And uh, we looked at the containers of syrup and realized we didn't have enough. He was here very early, uh, brought a bunch of snacks, which I think we have some left over that are available after service. I think there are some in the kitchen. We'll make sure that those are available. Uh, but just what a great testimony of, of, uh, of giving. He's, he makes sure that we have those supplies uh, every single week, and it's just such a blessing to so many people. I, <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bro brother Kelly's smiling real big. I don't know if he's smiling because he knows stories about his brother that he'd like to share in this moment of glory, or I'm just kidding. But we are truly thankful for everyone that helped uh, yesterday. Um, I, I got uh, a number of, of messages yesterday uh, from friends of mine on social media saying how much they enjoy seeing what our church is doing, not just for the community, but for ourselves to try to create an atmosphere of unity. And uh, what a testament. What a testament. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you excited about what God's going to do here today? I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do in this place. Daniel, the third chapter, we're just going to read a few verses. You know this story. I just want to focus on these three verses. We're going to read verses 16, 17, and 18. And I would invite you to read it in concert with us. And it reads like this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is Hang on. Our God whom we serve is... I'm going to let you do that one more time. Our God whom we serve is... To deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And He will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We're not going to serve the God you've put up, and we're not going to worship the God that you've put up. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Turn to your neighbor, look them eyeball to eyeball, and tell them our God is able. Find somebody else, look them, look them straight in the eye, and say, our God is able. Let me ask you a question. Is there anybody here today that would be honest and transparent enough to say, I have a situation, I have trouble, I have something going on that's bigger than I am? Anybody? 
All right, close your eyes just for a second. We've done this a few times before, and I want you to look, look at that thing through your mind's eye. Picture it real good. Are you seeing it? Do you see it right now? Now open your eyes. It's in front of you. I want you to stare that thing in the face and I want you to say, Our God is able. Come on, shout it out. Our God is. Our God is. Somebody clap your hands unto the Lord. God, we praise you in this place. We magnify you and glorify you. We feel you moving. God, we feel you coursing through our spiritual veins. God, we feel you spiritually. We feel you physically. You're touching our minds. Our minds and our hearts are in the right place. And we are thankful. We're trusting you, God, to do the miraculous, to do a great and mighty and powerful work in and through each and every one of us. God, I pray that you would release the power from on high in this building today. God, let not one soul escape the power, the greatness, and the completeness of who you are in this place we pray God I pray for every soul I pray for every heart I pray for every mind I pray Lord right now in Jesus name that you would break chains in this place that you would give every one of us an opportunity to move forward from where we are today we believe we trust we rejoice we worship we praise in the fact God, that we know that you are able. Jesus, have your way in this place. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone said amen. One more time, would you shout it out? Our God is able. One more time, our God is able. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. At the center of the Christian faith is the conviction that there is a God of power who the Bible describes as being able to do exceeding abundant things in all things. This conviction is stressed over and over again in the Old and New Testaments and Right here, right now, at the onset of this service in this present moment, I want to recognize that the God whom we worship is not a weak and incompetent God, but a God that is able to beat back the waves of opposition and able to bring low mountains of evil. The ringing testimony of the Christian faith has always been and always must be first that God is able. The contemplation of God we've talked about before is an awesome task. Any attempt to comprehend him in his fullness proves as futile as trying to dam up the mighty Mississippi with a twig or to reach the top of Mount Everest with a step stool or to stop the launch of the shuttle with strands of thread. Concerning the greatness of God, R.G. Lee once wrote, God is the creator behind all creation. God is the designer behind all design. God is the lawmaker behind all law. God is the supreme fact of history. God is the supreme fact of science. God is the supreme fact of philosophy. Because God, because God is God alone. God is the mighty God personally and actively present in the affairs of the universe. God is the great need of the human heart. God is the great need of the vast creation in which we live. Genesis, the first chapter, and the first verse says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And I want to focus for a moment on the first four words of that scripture. In the beginning God, somebody say God. In the beginning, God lets us know the criteria 
of continuing to read the scripture. Because God doesn't explain himself. He does not prove himself. That's why neuroticism is futile because God does not appeal to our intellect to explain his origin or identity. He requires that we by faith embrace his preexistence before evening and the morning were the first day God. Before the evening and the morning were the first day, he says, I was there to make the first day become the first day. In the beginning, somebody shout God. If you can't embrace that, you can close your Bible and walk out the door now. The, the problem today is that we know a lot about church, but not a whole lot about God. We, we, we know a lot about protocol, but not a lot about God. We know a lot about how to sound, but not a lot about God. We know a lot about what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, but not a lot about God. So we sing songs about ourselves, with ourselves, to entertain ourselves, where we used to sing songs about God. We used to sing about his faithfulness and his greatness and his might and his power, but now we sing about us because we only want God so we can have a better us. But in the beginning, somebody shout God. I pray the day would return where people shout about God and not about cars and not about houses and not about bank accounts and not about all their stuff. It used to be in the old church. I know it wasn't as fancy as some of the things we have today and, and we didn't have some of what we do today. But when we would start singing about God and the old rugged cross when we started singing about those things the glory would fall in the building and the spirit of God would move in an unprecedented way because brother Adam when you were a believer back then it meant you had to love God it didn't matter what the stage looked like it didn't matter what kind of presence you had it wasn't about people or dates or opportunity it was all about God. I remember as a young man going for weeks, weeks, multiple weeks, sometimes five, six, seven, eight weeks in a row, seven days a week and two services on Sunday, eight services a week, sometimes for seven, eight, nine weeks, getting together after our day of work on Monday, pastor, yes, on Monday, on Tuesday, pastor, yeah, on Tuesday at seven o'clock, and, and at midnight picking people up off the ground because the power of God was so strong in the place that people could not leave his presence. In the beginning, somebody shout God. If it doesn't start with God, it can't end with God. And the recognition of who he is propels us to declare the greatness of God. Somebody shout, God is great. Before we can go any further this morning, we must establish that God is great. When we can recognize God for his greatness, we can then and only then close the door on fear and doubt. Let, let me make it plain to you. I, I remember watching Michael Jordan playing basketball as I was growing up. And, and, and I know that he lost a lot of games. And, and I know that he missed a lot of shots, but I remember now and only saw then was his greatness because of the perspective that I had in his ability to play the game. Because of that perspective, I never lost faith in any game he played. The Bulls could be down by 20 points with three minutes to go, but in my mind, I was saying the great one is in the game and he might only have 
two minutes, but as long as Jordan has his hand on the ball, uh, you know, everything's going to be okay. I want to remind somebody today, let it be known in Landmark Church that the God we serve has never lost a battle. The God we serve has never been defeated. The God we serve has never missed a shot or been brought low by the darts of the enemy. Why? Because our God is great. First Chronicles chapter 29 verse 11 says, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh is there anything too hard for me? Revelations chapter 1 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. God's telling you who He is, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. The psalmist wrote in Psalms chapter 91, verses 1 and 2, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Jeremiah proclaimed in chapter 32, verse 17, ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm and there is nothing too hard for thee. David wrote in Psalms chapter 24, verse 1, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell within. David wrote in Psalms Psalms chapter 145, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of all thy wondrous works and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness David who shall declare God's greatness David said I will declare God's greatness just a few chapters later David said praise him in the firmament of his power praise him for his mighty acts praise him according to his excellent greatness you see we get hung up on how and we forget the why. We get hung up on protocol. We get hung up on practice. We get hung up on what we've perfected. How we know how to clap. How we know how to jump. We we get hung up on goosebumps. And David said, it's not about drums, but we're going to use them. It's not about the harp, but we're going to use it. It's not about cymbals, but we're going to use it. David said, before you praise him for all of this other stuff, you need to praise him because he is great because of his power because of his acts and because of his greatness I came to remind somebody today that there's nobody like Jesus that we serve a great God that we serve an all powerful God that is able to do anything and everything And before we can praise him for what he's done, we have to be able to praise him because of who he is. I said God is great and he is greatly to be praised. 
What are you saying, pastor? I'm saying quit holding back. I'm saying let it all go. God is great. And because he's great, he deserves a great prize. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. Somebody shout, God is great. Scholars believe that there's at least a 20 year gap between the second chapter and the third chapters of Daniel. And that during this time, something drastically changed in the heart of King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of chapter two, you can read it for yourself. Nebuchadnezzar made a glorious tribute to Daniel and to Daniel's God. He actually proclaimed, truly your God is the God of gods. Woo. He, 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 he wasn't a Jew. He, he, didn't, he didn't serve Jesus. He, he didn't worship God. But he made a statement, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret. But at the beginning of chapter 3, the God of Daniel was no longer elevated in the king's mind. He had decided to command his kingdom to worship a common idol, a massive image on the Babylonian plain of Dura. Nebuchadnezzar decreed that all the leaders in Babylon would bow before this image. This was clearly intended to be a religious act. I came to talk to somebody because the word worship occurs 11 times in this text. He wanted people to worship the image and to appropriately dedicate this image. Nebuchadnezzar sent out an invitation to the entire Babylonian official family. And it's interesting if you study the scripture, verse two and three are almost identical. And let me share with you what I believe that means. Verse 2 are people who were invited. And verse 3 are people who came. You see, it's important to understand that in Babylon, there was no such thing as an RSVP. If the king invited you to come, you showed up. And verse 4 tells us there will be music and whosoever doesn't fall to the ground and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Now, Nebuchadnezzar wanted everyone to bow down and, and to worship. Somebody say worship worship his image at the same time and and the Bible tells us that he employed his royal orchestra to try and pull this off Some have estimated that the head count may have been as many as 300,000 people at this deal with people coming from all over the vast Babylonian empire And when the orchestra began to play, all 300,000 attendees hit the ground and bowed down before this image, all 300,000 except for three. Let me tell you something. If there's 300,000 people in a crowd, and all of them fall on their face to worship something, and you decide you're not going to bow, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. And that's the defiance in verses eight and nine. At that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to the king, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not only not only did they see that there were people standing, but the accusers knew their name. You see, when you decide to stand up for what's right, you better believe the devil's going to learn your name. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Now, I want to show you something. Can I show you something today? These Chaldean officials are the very same Chaldean officials that 
Daniel and his three friends had prayed for when they were getting ready to lose their lives. The accusers, the accusers of today were the ones that Daniel and the three boys stood up for in prayer some time ago. And had Daniel not intervened before God, these Chaldeans would be dead. But isn't it interesting how long it took for them to forget what God had done? And now they're coming back as the accusers of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they stood shamelessly before the king and brought the three accusations against these men. First, they accused them of disrespecting King Nebuchadnezzar. Second, they accused them of not paying due regard to him. And thirdly, they accused them of not serving his gods. They did not Worship your image. That was one that got, that was really the one that got them into trouble. You see, we need to be a people who are willing to stand when nobody else will. And something that you need to know and understand is that not everybody you've helped, not everyone you've prayed for, not everyone you've gone to pick up, not everyone you've witnessed to, not everyone you've healed, not everyone you've lent money to, not not everyone that you've been there in their darkest hour will be there for you when they should be. You see, not everyone, not everyone has the faith to stand on their own when things start getting hot. That's one of the reasons why we have to know who our friends are. That's one of the reasons why we have to be choosy. It's one of the reasons why Sister Andy, the Bible says, the righteous judgeth all things. We have to make sure that, that we know where we are, when we're there. We have to know those around us, the ones that we have, have given ourselves to, to pour into us, are also gonna be the ones that are standing next to us when we're facing the fire of our life. I can't think, I can't help but think uh, how easy it would have been for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to forfeit their faith and blend in with their new culture and rationalize their accommodations of the Babylonian lifestyle with all of its idolatry and promiscuity. But these men decided that when it came to worship, they couldn't worship anybody but who they said they were gonna worship. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil, uh, he wants your worship. Now I'm not saying that any of you are going home and you got a little statue of a red man that has, has bottom half looks like a goat and his top half he's got a nice shaved beard with horns coming out. I'm not saying anybody's going home and getting on your knees and, and saying oh praise Satan. Oh praise the devil but I'm here to tell you that anything that takes your eyes away from God is receiving your worship. Anything that gets between you and God it is consuming your worship I've said it from this pulpit before and I'll say it I want it to be loud and clear anything that you choose to worship outside of God you need to be sure that it can heal you when you're sick you need to be sure it can pull you up out of hell when you need a hand you need to make sure that when you call on it that it's going to be there in the midnight hour don't allow anything in this life to take your worship. These men had done nothing to deserve their situation. But and instead of being rewarded for their refusal to serve and worship the golden image, they're faced with death. It just proves to me that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And see, this is where we lose a lot of folks because right there, when it gets tough, you know, these boys could have looked at that and said, God, here we are standing up for you and look what you're making me go through. You're not even here. You're not even with me. Can I talk to us today? 
They didn't do anything. They didn't sin. They weren't out of the will of God. They stood up for what was right and now they're faced with death. And I had to ask myself more than once in my life how they were able to stand strong in the middle of a situation where so many others so are so quick to fall. I want to show you a couple of things today. Can I share those with you? Number one is these men were men of conviction. Of conviction. Their actions were not the product of convenience or comfort but of conviction. They, they were men of made up minds who did not need to test the wind to determine if they needed to change their behavior to accommodate their current circumstance. What I mean by that is there, there used to be an old saying about going out and test the wind and, and, and hunters do it a lot. They'll walk out into the middle of the field and they'll take their finger and they lick the end of their finger and they'll stick it up in the air to see which way the wind's blowing to determine how they're going into the woods or how they're going to approach this or how they're going to approach that. The problem is not so much with hunting as much as it is the way we live our physical and our spiritual lives. These men had no need to defend what they knew to be right and they refused to blackmail God. I know nobody in here is guilty of this but these boys didn't say God if you get this king off our backs then we won't bow. There was none of that. These boys didn't jump up and say God if you'll make a, uh, if you'll make a bunch of birds fly over us at 20 kilometers per hour heading in this specific direction and then fall down on three people that are four rows back from the front then God we're going to give you all we got they did not they did not they did not blackmail God they simply stood up for what they believed and what they knew to be right and lastly they were motivated by what pleased God they were worshipers they were the one thing that the Bible says it's the one thing that the Bible says God is seeking the Bible says he seeketh such to worship him. What does God want? He wants worshipers. These men please God because they made up in their mind, I refuse to worship anything else but God. God in every one of my actions in every decision that I make I want it to be clear that the only thing that I am going to worship is God the one true God and there is nothing that can sway me from that there's no doubt the enemy suggested compromise as he often does. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Suggesting that the image is nothing and, and that there would have there would be real no no real effect if they participated outwardly but kept their faith internally. In other words, you can give them what they want without changing what you believe. And I'm telling you, if that's your theory, if that's your theology, that action dethrones God and it enthrones yourself. You are not strong enough by yourself to face the fiery trial of your life. You need God on your side every single time you come up against something. And if we get to that point, if we're in that kind of a situation where we're saying, well, I'm just gonna go ahead and stand because on the inside, I, I really believe what I say I believe. It, it doesn't mean anything. I'm just doing this to protect myself. If that's our attitude and if that's how we're living our spiritual life, I'm just gonna call it what it is. It's idolatry. You see, you cannot compromise your faith without grave consequences. Can I share a story with you? I'm reminded of the story of a Bedouin who was eating dates while he laid in his bed in his tent and his candle was burning brightly beside his bed and, and he reached over and he grabbed a date and he took a big bite out of the date but he saw there was a big worm in it so he discarded the date. He reached over and he grabbed another one and he bit into it, Brother Jeff, and guess what? There was another worm in the middle. What was this man's solution? His solution was 
Jesus, he just blew out the candle and ate the rest of the dates in the darkness. Yeah, now I know that story is humorous, but it is so fitting on how we we live our spiritual life. We come to church and we hear what we need to hear to feel like we're saved and, and we're okay and we can make it a little bit longer and we're on the right path, but we leave here and do things that compromise the plan of God for our lives. It compromises our faith and our convictions and find justification somewhere along the line by covering it up in the darkness of the night. Now I know that this hurts and some of you are pulling your toes back in your shoe but I'm here to tell you we need to get rid of that ignorant spirit and get a hold of an old fashioned desire to please God. Oh church I hope you're hearing me. I hope you're hearing me today. We need to be rebaptized with a fresh fire and a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost. Our greatest desire every time we come together every time we open our eyes in the morning ought to be to please God. I said we're here to please him. Sister Moore, the old song says, oh, I want to see him. I'm here to tell you today, if you want to see him, you better get to pleasing him. The only way you're going to see him is if you're ready and willing to please him. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord. I know some people don't like this kind of preaching. But can I tell you, just pull it, it's all right. Some people don't like this kind of preaching. They don't like when a pastor tells you the truth about stuff. But I'm here to tell you every single person under the sound of my voice, you need it. I don't care if you've heard it a hundred thousand times before. You need it. You need to be reminded of this kind of stuff. We all need it. You can find watered down preaching anywhere. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm here to tell you, watered down preaching may offer a user friendly God to the world, but it does nothing to address and eliminate the worms that are destroying our society, destroying our friendships, destroying our families, and destroying our churches. I can't speak for any of you today, but I'm sick and I'm tired of the devil having his way in our churches, in our families, in our friendships. I'm tired of him having his way with our spouses and our children. I'm tired of it and I refuse to let it pass through me anymore. I refuse to settle just so my flesh is comfortable. I refuse to give in because life gives stuff. I'm in this for the long haul, baby. I'm not going to get out of this just because something is tough. I said I refuse to give in because it gets tough. I'm in this, Brother Adam, for the long haul. And there is no demon or devil in hell that's big enough or bad enough to defeat my God, Jesus Christ, and convince me to give up, throw in the towel, or fail. The Bible says we are in Jesus Christ. And if we are, we are on the winning side. If you're on the winning side today, would you give God some praise? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew what they believed and they believed what they knew. And their deep certainty concerning God's will meant that they valued God's commandments above their own lives. These men, these men didn't choose death, but they didn't run from it either. It's always easiest Sister Sue, it's always easiest to do what everyone else is doing. But my conviction, 
will not allow me to turn away from the one true standard in my life and that is God is everything and everything else is nothing. Paul says, I've looked around at my life, all of the successes that I've had, everything that I've done, and I count it all as dung compared to what I have in him in relationship. Paul recognized that God is everything and everything else is nothing. Someone say conviction. Second thing about these boys were they were men of confidence. You see, these men, can I, can I preach to us today? Are you all ready to tear some things down? I'm telling you, God is getting ready to release something in this building. Can I speak prophetically to you? God is getting ready to release some power in this building that is going to destroy yokes that you have been fighting for years, year after year after year. You make up in your mind. A new year comes around and you decide this is my resolution. I'm going to cut it off. I'm going to walk away from it. And three days later, it comes knocking back at your door and you say well I'm just going to do it one more time well I'm going to pick it up one more time well I'm just going to go there one more time and I'm telling you God in this building today in this service if you're watching this on Facebook I'm speaking prophetically he is going to release the power to terminate the chains and the bonds that are on you to Hey, I don't know who I'm preaching to right now, but there's somebody under the sound of my voice. You act like you got it all together. You act like you got it all figured out, but inside you're nothing more than a blubbering, ugly mess. And God wants me to tell you today that today is your day. He's gonna move in your life. He's gonna move in your spirit. And he's gonna mend things that you never thought possible for him to mend. Some Somebody needs to hear your pastor right now. I said, God is going to do something in you today that everybody else said is impossible. These men had confidence in God's ability. Somebody say, God is great. They had confidence in God's ability, not their ability. That's where we get tripped up because we want God to formulate his plan in our idiosyncrasies, in our ideas, in our little box of thinking. We want God to work the miraculous in and through us the way we believe and or think that it should happen. But this just tells us that these men had confidence in God's ability, not their ability. When they looked at the situation before them, they saw that they served a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all they could ask or think. You see they refused because of their history to allow others to convince them to put God in some kind of a box. Can I remind you the stories that these boys grew up with? You see they knew he was the one who introduced himself to Abraham as almighty God and of whom Jeremiah declared nothing is too hard for thee. They knew he is the one that spoke this world into existence and put the sun up for the day and the moon up for the night. He, they knew he was the one who held back the sea from the dry land. They knew he was the one who spoke to Moses and performed the greatest jailbreak in all of history. They knew he was the one that sent manna to feed his people in the wilderness. They knew he was the one who knocked down the walls of Jericho. A sister Hannah talked about earlier. They knew he is the one that sent a fire to consume the sacrifice for Elijah. They knew he's the one who took a young man named David and helped him slay Goliath with a sling and a rock. They knew he's the one who helped Jehoshaphat defeat his enemies with the nation's choir. They knew he was the one who shut the mouths of lions and pulled Daniel from their den. They recognized him as an awesome God as a holy God, as the all-powerful God. And they were absolutely 100% certain that God was able to deliver them out of their dilemma. These men were able to stand 
because of their unshakable confidence in God's ability. There was no question as to if he could. You see, they knew that he could. I hope you've been paying attention, taking notes, going back and studying the lessons that we've had on faith. Because in those, in those messages, we talked about how many of us profess that we believe that he can, but I wonder if we really believe that he can. How many of us really believe that God can? How many of us really believe that God has the power to do the miraculous? How many of us believe that God can really step into our situation and break the yoke and take the stress and take the doubt and take the fear and take all of that junk that's been piled on you for years, put it on his back and help you make it down the road? I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've been through with regard to your faith, but I believe that today, right now, that now is the time for those of us who are true believers to stand up and proclaim boldly his power I don't know about you but I believe God is able I believe God is able to supply I believe God is able to heal I believe God is able to deliver I believe God is able to save I believe God is able to restore I believe God is able to remove mountains what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying cancer is gone. AIDS is gone. Drugs are gone. Depression is gone. Fear is gone. Bitterness is gone. Hatred is gone. Poverty is gone. Pain is gone. Torment is gone. Our God whom we serve is able. Somebody worship the Lord. Come on, somebody worship the Lord. I've come to build your faith today. He's got it all in control. He's still at the wheel. I said our God is able. I'm talking about a God that is able. I declare to you today that there is nobody like Jesus. There is no other name given among men underneath heaven whereby we must be saved. There is nobody like this God that we serve. Woo! I'm telling you, God is wanting to do something great to you in here today. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 12 says, Behold, the Lord God hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out of heaven with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. In complete awe, I believe that we can say with David as he did in Psalms 113, who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself. Behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. What are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to remind somebody. He's the one that parted the Red Sea. He's the one that shut the mouths of lions. He's the one that crushed the enemies with Gideon's 300. He healed Naaman by having him dip in the dirty Jordan. He turned water into wine. He fed 5,000. He healed Bartimaeus, he stepped out on a stormy sea and walked on the water. He spoke to the storm and it ceased. He cast demons out of the man at Galilee. He hung on a cross and bore all of our sins and died a death that we were worthy of. But in the middle of that, he went down to hell and he took away the way of escape from our sin. He took the keys of death and hell. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there are many things and people that will disappoint you in this life and fall short. But one thing you can stand on is the fact that God is able. Oh, come on, somebody clap your hands to the Lord. I said it a few weeks ago as we were talking about faith, but I want to remind somebody else tonight that your furnace is not final. The affliction that you are in today is not final. The situation you're in today is not final. The heat that you feel and that you see and the words coming out of the oppressor's mouth out of the enemy's mouth is not final. Watch this. They said if it be so our God whom we serve is 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 is. Our God whom we serve is from the burning fiery furnace. That's our affliction. That's right in front of us. But we want you to know that he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. I I don't know about the furnace. I don't know if I'm gonna make it through this situation in front of me. But one thing I know is regardless of what happens to me in the furnace experience, he's not gonna leave me in your hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you see, they were able to see beyond their circumstance and understand it doesn't matter what's happening in my life. God is in control. They said I may not escape the furnace but you can bet if not in this life then the one to come that I'm coming out of here. The furnace isn't final for me. Cancer isn't final for me. Depression isn't final for me. Loneliness isn't final for me. Joblessness isn't final for me. Blindness isn't final for me. Hatred isn't final for me. Disappointment isn't final for me. Our God is able. Would you stand to your feet? I'm coming to a close. Pastor, how do you know? Because Brother Cisco, the Bible says he's the author. He's the author and the finisher. <laughs> Woo! Nobody else. Not your spouse, not your kids, not your grandma, not your neighbor, not that person you can't stand to work with. He, God alone, is the author and the finisher of of my faith Bible declares he's alpha and he is omega he's the beginning and the end and my destiny is not in your hands Woo! you see the three Hebrew boys looked at that furnace and said you didn't put us here oh Lord have mercy <laughs> We know that you think you did. (laughs) But you're not the one who put us here anyway. How do I know that? Because, Brother Adam, God writes my story. Nobody else has a pen to my life. Only. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I say, only God can write your story. He is sovereign. And He alone determines my circumstance. I need somebody in this building to do today is say I refuse to surrender I I, I refuse to bow I refuse to give in I refuse to go down everybody else may but I refuse you see we are in the last days and facing things we've never faced before and we need the miraculous in our lives we need divine intervention and we can have it when we commit ourselves to Jesus Completely. Our God 
God whom we serve is. Our God whom we serve is. To deliver us from the fiery furnace. But he will deliver us from thy hand. They said was, devil, you can go ahead and rejoice. You go ahead and get excited about the furnace. You throw a party, put up streamers, invite other demons to come over and rejoice in my trial. But you need to know something, it may consume my body. But you were never in control of this anyway. So you need to know that this isn't final for me. My destiny is in the master's hand. And whether I come out of the furnace or not, I'm coming out of your hand. God is able. You can't hold me. Your hand can't keep me from the miraculous. Or oh, I wish somebody would get a hold of what I'm trying to tell you today. Our God is. Our God is. I want this side of the church, I want you to just to turn where you can face that side. This side of the church, I want you to turn and face that side. And right down the middle, one and a half of you turn this way and the other half turn that way. Are you ready? Our God is. Faithful. Look at him and tell him, our God is. Faithful. Our God is. Faithful. Come on, find somebody else and tell him, our God is. I said our God is able. I said our God is able. Can I take you just one more second? Now I'm going to turn you loose. Watch this. The de declaration of removal from Nebuchadnezzar's hand was a recognition from these three Hebrew boys that even in bondage, physical incarceration never meant they were under control of the oppressor. Woo! They told old Nebi, they said, we know, baby, that you think you're in control, but the only hand that holds us is the hand of the one and only true God. Pastor, how did this end? Well, let me tell you. Verse 26 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, and he spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth in the midst of the fire. And the princes and governors and captains and king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power nor was an hair of their head singed neither were their coats changed nor the smell of fire had passed on them what are you saying pastor I'm telling you that when you come through this you're not even going to smell like you've been through I feel like MC Hammer today and saying, you can't touch this baby. Watch this. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god. Ha <laughs> ha! Woo! Except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree that every people, nation, and language would speak anything among miss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this. I said our God is hate. Final verse of that chapter says, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Don't give up 
I know it's terrifying. I know it's scary. I know it's bigger than you are. I know everybody else is doing it. And sometimes when we're in these situations, it's so hard to stand. But I'm imploring you, would you accept the prophetic work, with prophetic word of your pastor today? Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't throw in the towel. I know you feel alone, but if you'll stand when no one else will, you'll show up in the fire. Is there anybody that needs God to work a miracle in your life today? Are you ready to receive it? It depends on you. I want you to know, in the spirit, I see God walking around saying, who, who, who's going to get it? Who's going to let me do it? Who's, who's going to let me pour it out? I'm ready. I've got all of this blessing. i got all this power. i got all this healing. i got all this mercy. I have all this grace. I have this deliverance. I have. Who's going to be? Who's it going to be? Who's it going to be? Would you lift your hands and your voice right now? I don't care how you pray. If you need to be seated, you be seated. If you want to kneel, you want to kneel. But I want you to raise your hands. And I want you to raise your voice. And I want you to say, our God is able. Come on, our God is able. Our God is able. God you see every single one of us God you see every single one you see every single one of us God God, I pray right now for every soul. I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. God, you see dark hours. God, you see. You see these dark corners. God, you see these areas of defeat. God, you see and understand the torment and the terror. God, you know the hurt and the pain. God, you see the bodies that are will withered with disease. God, you see the trial and the heart and the mind of men and women that are in this building and across our broadcast today. But God, right now I stand upon the authority of your word and the promise of your anointing and your, prof your prophecy that's gone forth in this place. God, I release the power to break chains in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I speak with power and anointing right now. In the name of Jesus, be healed. In the name of Jesus, be released. In the name of Jesus, be delivered. Yeah. Jesus. There is no one higher than you. Yes. There's no one higher yes. than you. Come on, somebody. There is no one higher, no one greater, no one like our God. There is none more able, Christ our Savior. Somebody, we're talking about God today. Our God is able. Our God is able. You mean for me, Pastor? Yes, I mean for you. He is able. Allow Him to break that chain. Allow Him to break that addiction. Allow Him to break that pain. Allow him to break that hurt in the name of Jesus. Our God is able. I said he's able. 
I said God is able. Yes, he is. Receive it right now in Jesus' name. Yeah. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. Our God is able. God's getting ready to break something in this place today. Yes, he is. He's getting ready to break something in this place today. I said, I will bless the Lord. wonder why in the world does he push us to do this stuff because I understand the power in it Pastor Chris, Pastor David I'm trying to change somebody's perspective, you can't do the same things you've always done and expect a different result some of you need to get crazy for a moment, you need to show that thing you don't have control over me and in the middle of my fire, in the middle of my furnace I'm going to recognize God is able. That's it. Come on, Sister Patty.
you're scaring the devil half to death. You're scaring your situation half to death. How can they praise him? How can they lift him up? Oh, I said, because my God is able. I said, because my God is able. Oh, all the time. Yes, 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 yes. I said, God is able. So I want you to join hands with your neighbor. If it's appropriate to do so, join hands with somebody next to you. Come on. Come on. Come on, that's it, move. Oh. Are you ready for it? Somebody just let go for a moment. Hey, hey, hey. 
in this place I feel the power do you remember the furnace Jesus went into the devil thought he had if I can just kill his body if I can just wipe him off the face of this earth and for three days, the devil and all of his hymns threw a party. They had streamers and balloons and cake and those little gazoos, and they were talking about the great thing that they had done. But the earth started shaking and began to quaking, and all of a sudden, Jesus kicked the door down, walked through and said, oh, by the way, you didn't do anything but free me to do what I was put here to do anyway. God is able. I wonder, would you clap your hands to the Lord one more time? Our God is, our God is, I've challenged you to do this before, I'm not naive and I, I know how we are and we hear these kinds of things and when we leave they just fall in the dust under our feet. But some of you need to find a piece of paper and in big words write God our God is able. 
our God is and put it on your mirror. You know what we like to look at more than anything else in this world? Us. We act like we don't. Oh, my hair looks terrible. My smile isn't what it used to be. Boy, I'm taking up three times as much room as I used to. But we all like to look at ourselves. Put that someplace where every single day you've got to walk in and look at that first and say, our God is able. Let me tell you something. Somebody in this service got it today. Somebody across our broadcast got it today. And in the next couple of days, we're going to hear testimonies how, hey, pastor, that thing I used to do, I don't do it anymore. That thing I've been fighting with, for whatever reason, it's gone now. That thing that I've been struggling with that's been tormenting me and making it where I can't sleep at night, it's gone. I'm finding rest in the Lord. Why? Because our God is able. Praise the name of the Lord. Can I testify to you? Facebook, we love you so very much. We'll see you Wednesday night. God bless you. We thank you so much for being here with us today. Can I share something?